right, ladies and gentlemen, the last panel of the day. So if anybody was in the audience yesterday, uh, I'm Walt Davis. Uh, get the privilege to moderate the last panel of our great aviation program managers and TRADOC capability managers. Uh, I, I think I said last year, you know, the last panel, the exhibit hall is coming down around us, and there were like three people in the audience. So I'm glad to see everybody hanging tough. Got a great group of uh, leaders up here that uh, are going to share their thoughts with you on how they're doing, wh what they're working on, what's important to them, what their challenges are. So I'll do some quick introductions, and I'm going I'll, to I'll start. Matt Hanna is the program uh, manager for aviation systems, the lint trap of everything that's going on. And is that kind of the right thing? That's what, that's what I endearingly call it. But yeah. Yong Lee, PM for Aviation Survivability Equipment. Uh, Ryan Coyle has the Tickham for uh, Brigades, which is the lint trap down at Tradoc for all of the system stuff. Paul Cravey is the Tickham for Unmanned Aircraft Systems. Uh, Colonel Courtney Cody is the uh, PM for Unmanned Aircraft Systems. Rich Tyler, the Deputy PM for, uh, for Attack Helicopters. And then uh, Jeff White is the well, it seemed to be leaving here, is, is the Tickham for recon attack, and as they merge a couple of the capabilities down there, Paul's going to get a bigger portfolio. And then Dave Phillips, the PM for uh, soft rotary wing, and he's going to be first up. Each, each individual kind of by capability is going to talk for four or five minutes. We'll try to leave some time for questions at the end. I know there was a question initially yesterday about uh, AH6 and, you know, what we're doing in terms of the final kind of block upgrade on that. But anyway, I'll turn it over to Colonel Phillips. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good to see some familiar faces here late on uh, Friday afternoon. Some familiar faces up here on the stage, which is uh, always good to have your friends with you. Um, so I'm the Rotary Wing Program Executive Officer down in Tampa at McDill Air Force Base at Special Operations Command Headquarters. Uh, what does that mean? That means we provide the direct support to the program offices that are primarily the Technology Applications Program Office, uh, the Simulation Training Systems Program Office up in Orlando, the Silent Night Radar Program Office, and the Mel B Program Office. So out of those programs, just to give you a quick snapshot of what our priorities are, we have uh, three major lines of effort. Uh, the first one really is sustaining our current fleet. Like anyone else, we're all in the fight, and so we're, we're making sure we can sustain our current fleet for today's fight. The next one is recapitalizing our major airframes for the, for the fight of tomorrow, really. So we're talking about the MH-47G Renew program, the Block 3 Little Bird program, and the MH-60M uh, program that we just completed here a couple years ago. Uh, and then finally is really looking at those new technologies, the right new technologies to transform and, and be ready for the future. So those, those are our three big efforts. Be happy to take questions on those as we get into a little bit more detail. Uh, we're probably now closer with Army on all of our programs and with PEO Aviation and PEO IWS support, I don't think we could do it without them. And I'd say we're closer today in all our programs, leveraging development, qualification, testing, we're doing a lot more today together than we ever have that I've seen in the past. So it, that's, that's a refreshing thing for me, and I think it's refreshing for all of Army and for soft aviation. Um, we, we're primarily focused, obviously, on getting our ground force operators to targets around the world every day safely. So a couple things I'll highlight on the new technology side. The first one is uh, the Degraded Visual Environment Program. We're looking to get to all of those places we want to go at a time and place of our choosing and make those last, that, that RP inbound, and the departure from the LZ as safe as we can make it. Give those guys as much situational awareness as possible so we'll, we'll absolutely increase their survivability. The second piece is actual survivability. We're trying to, trying to stay ahead and keep our comparative advantage against all of those potential threats on the battlefield and really be ready for any of those contested environments of the future. So those two things just to highlight, and uh, with that, I'll pass it off uh, to our our next uh, speaker. I'm not which one. Not sure. well, I, I think Matt is going to be. Matt. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Matt Hanna. I'm the uh, Aviation Systems Project Manager. Uh, so I have about 49 programs spread out over five major areas. Uh, aviation ground support equipment. Uh, their uh, big effort right now is uh, full rate production, 
and fielding of the Aviation Light Utility Mobile Maintenance Cart, a LUMSI for short, and that's uh, basically a flight line vehicle that uh, is transportable. Another subject matter area is uh, aviation mission equipment, so all your radios, transponders, uh, everything that's common across multiple airframes inside the cockpit. Uh, their big uh, effort right now is uh, assured position, navigation, and timing, as well as uh, maintaining the platform PMs, uh, radios off their production lines, uh, ARC 231s and such. <clears throat> Aviation network mission planning is a third area within uh, aviation systems. They handle all the software programs, such as uh, uh, aviation flight records and things like that. Their biggest effort right now is uh, fielding of the aircraft notebook. Uh, it's a uh, software program that allows uh, for maintenance uh, management. And uh, fourth area is uh, air traffic control. Uh, they do both fixed-based and tactical air traffic control. Their big effort right now is the uh, mobile tower system, or MOTS, that's currently in production. Uh, it's in their final production phase right now. The last area is degraded visual environment, and uh, that, that program is uh, just coming up off the ground. And uh, I'll let my uh, counterpart, uh, Colonel Coyle, talk to the requirements documentation that they're moving forward on. All right, I guess we'll jump to me then really quick. So as, as said, Tickham Aviation Brigade, so people always ask, well, what is that? Um, it's really kind of anything that's not a platform. So as kind of Matt touched on, within the aviation mission command and interoperability piece, it's your, your networks, your satellite comms, your radios, our links into those. Um, then the aircraft survivability division, which very much links into Colonel Lee and, and all of his you know, all those programs, whether it's um, the detection side, the defeat side, so that all falls within the portfolio. And then within that aircraft survivability division is also the DVE piece that Matt touched on. So I'll, I'll stop there for a second, just hit really quick. DVE, much like um, Colonel Phillips just pointed out, that in our initial increment is really no, no different than we've been moving out on for the last few years. But our ability to take off and land, provide the situational awareness, in a, in a dust or sand environment. And that, that's what we're initially doing. But I think um, even the CG very much drove it home yesterday um, that our ultimate objective is to be able to operate in multiple environments, take off land, fly en route, engage and destroy the enemy, or land you know, soldiers there on an objective area so they can do what they have to do and then bring them home. So that's the, that's the ultimate goal within the, you know, as we move out on this DVE endeavor. Um, and then within the portfolio, which also links me very close to Matt, is that aviation logistics side. So anything that's really not platform specific. Um, so one thing, the, the crane we use on the flight line, just one example. Um, also within the portfolio is the kind of the air, air warrior currently, soon to be air soldier ensemble of the, the uniform and the things that the soldiers wear, whether it's from the, the mass to facilitate it, uh, NBC environment or CBRN environment. Um, to just what they wear day to day flying. Um, and then uh, within the portfolio too, linked into ASD um, really becomes the uh, ASDAT, which, which most of you knew that as the kind of shoot down team that the Army will send out to determine uh, what possibly brought down an aircraft somewhere in the world. But the key link there is now we've got them closer to our aircraft survivability division which allows them to really update that threat. And then when we're tied into to Colonel Lee, um, that, that we are writing requirements where there's a real understanding of the current threat, what the future threat may look like. So that, that link has been very powerful, I would say, there at USACE. And then just the last thing in the portfolio, if anybody wants to ask a question about, is really air traffic services. So the, uh, the mobile, the tactical towers, um, you know, the, the tactical radars, all those components that kind of fall within the air traffic services world. So I will, I will end there, and then, sir, who do you want me to, off to Colonel Lee, all right. Thanks, Ryan. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Colonel Zhang Lee, uh, PM for uh, Aircraft Survivability Equipment. Um, we actually fall under PEO IEWNS, uh, Info Intelligence, Electronic Warfare, and Sensor. Uh, PEO is uh, Major General Bomac up at Everett Improving Ground. So the two things that really I want to focus on as uh, far as uh, ASC that, uh, that's sort of different than or more highlight than uh, in the past is that we're definitely more linked into the uh, intelligence community because the threat is evolving and we want to make sure that we have uh, direct linkage to 
uh, emerging threats as well as the current threats. So that's the piece that I think something that I want to definitely uh, uh, emphasize. The second thing also is that uh, we are looking at the technologies to make sure that in addition to looking at the threats, we understand what does that mean to our current systems and what do we need to do to make sure that we're ahead, staying ahead of the threats. Uh, not only today, but also in the future. So those are the two things I think we want to definitely emphasize that's different or uh, more uh, emphasis than the previous uh, years. Um, so the, the way we are organized in Huntsville, Alabama is that we have three product offices. Uh, focusing on the first product office is the infrared countermeasures. So those are laser countermeasures against uh, man pads and other threats. Uh, in that portfolio, we have ATERCOM uh, for 47s, and the new program of record is the uh, common infrared countermeasure, which is the Kirkham, uh, that will uh, de defeat uh, the man pads uh, coming at the aircraft, and that is currently in the EMD phase, uh, going well, and uh, look forward to having a production decision next year. The second part of our program is a missile warning uh, portfolio, which looks at really the cur current missile warning system, which is a common infrared, common missile warning system. And then we also have a, 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 a new POR that is being um, um, stand up, stood up right now, which is the Advanced Threat Detection System. Uh, that's going to be, uh, uh, obviously, uh, Fort Rucker is uh, updating the CDD. And then interim is the Limited Interim Missile Warning System for limited number of aircraft, uh, which is uh, currently on uh, uh, competition right now. So, and then the third um, office is um, Threat Warning, which is looking at the uh, radar threat, radar and laser threats out there in the battlefield, especially with what's happening in certain parts of the world. Uh, those are systems that we're uh, making sure that they're relevant. And we're working closely with the Navy on the DV-2, APR-39 DV-2, which really uh, adopting the Navy's uh, radar warning system, uh, taking our radar warning from an analog to digital age, which is significant uh, uh, improvements in the capacity. So really look forward to hearing your questions and uh, answering your, uh, answer, uh, to answering those questions. Hi, my name is Paul Cravey. I am uh, the incumbent trade out capability manager for unmanned aircraft systems. Uh, the future Tickham RA where we combine both and Jeff dumps those big old rocks into my rucksack uh, from the Apache side. So if you got any, any questions about that, Ask him because I don't know yet. Um, UAS right now uh, in theater, it is the number one kinetic asset in theater, shooting thousands of shots a year uh, in the global war on terror. Our professional aviation soldiers are shooting it at above the percentage of kill rate that's advertised for the missiles that they're firing right now. And we're doing it cheaper and lives and dollars for taking the fight of the enemy. So it's a very important asset uh, nationally and strategically to our nation. Uh, we can employ it to support soldiers on the ground when risk, politics, and conditions prevent our manned assets from being in the fight. And if you've been in the fight and you couldn't get a manned asset over your head, you wanted something. So it's a, it's a pretty, uh, pretty nice thing to have it there. But, uh, you know, it's a nascent capability, and it, it's growing, and we can do it better. And as the further we go down this road with UAS, uh, the more things we see that we can fix both uh, systematically for the organization as well as uh, at the user end. Uh, a couple of the things that we're doing, we're transferring uh, proponency for small UAS to the Maneuver Center of Excellence. So the requirements for small UAS, and we're talking the, the handheld, the short-range micros, the soldier-borne sensors, the Ravens and the Pumas will go to them where they, the users that are going to use it can develop it specifically to their needs. Um, we are looking at options for runway independent or point takeoff and landing solutions for the BCTs right now. And we'll address that in our upcoming ICD. And we're looking to improve some of the systems we have. I mean, let's face it, the systems we got are going to be here for a long time. Uh, the Shadow has a very high audible signature. And so in the near future, we're going to be looking to upgrade a KPP with some new technology that will allow us to outdistance that signature and outdistance some of the threats of our near peers on the battlefield uh, to make that a more useful platform for the commander on the ground. Uh, we do have an ICD that uh, we are looking to get through an AROC uh, here in the early summer. Uh, that ICD will focus on a family, well, not really a family, a future UAS in total. So a scalable control interface and a future tactical UAS will be the first, uh, first things we go after for CDDs off that ICD once it's done. That scalable control interface moves the capability forward from the headquarters to the tactical edge in the hands of the soldier. 
So picture an app on your iPhone for UAS that you log into, get a level of interoperability with the UAS that is controlled by someone supervising the UAS, a 15 whiskey at the brigade level, and he can hand off multiple systems to people who need them and then can engage targets with those from their scalable control interface, interface through a uh, targeting solution that is part of that package. And then, of course, uh, the question du jour is uh, future tactical UAS. Uh, we do have hooks in the ICD for future tactical UAS, uh, for cargo UAS, and, and for everything that we see coming down the line. Uh, the bottom line is you're not going to get, we're not going to lay out whether that's a group one, a group two, a group three. We're going to tie it to the capability that we want. It's got to be expeditionary, survivable, armed, potentially multi-role, agile in the objective area, runway independent or point takeoff and landing, how you, however you want to refer to that, with the retained endurance that we already have, as well as have a reliable propulsion system so that we can continue to use it up as we go. So more of that coming, a lot of exciting things coming down the line. And I'm, uh, I'm Shona Bashona with my, uh, my PM partner here to uh, move forward together to be able to get some of those capabilities in the hands of the soldier. Courtney? Good afternoon, Courtney Cody, PM for Unmanned Aircraft Systems. I'm looking out and I'm seeing pretty, pretty much all the same faces I saw about an hour and a half ago, really. So I can, I, can, I can build the pyramid for you at Echelon and tell you how I deliver capability at Echelon, or uh, I can do by a show of hands how many already know the, know the script. All right. You guys lose out, or less hands up. Uh, so so as, as Paul described you, he's articulating based on what the user tells him, and quite honestly, what Paul and I together go out and observe. We go out and we, we sit with those units. We go to Afghanistan, Iraq, and the other places where we're employing these assets, and we talk to the units. Paul has a team, and they write it all down. We talk to the team and talk about the actual material they have in hand. Um, what can we do with the material we have on hand? Paul tries to weave out of that, what are the things that we can do to improve this system? And then we focus on delivering that material capability at Echelon. So down at the tactical level, we deliver those small UASs. Uh, we also deliver the OSRBT, which is a one system remote video terminal. It's incredible powerful, incredibly powerful capability all the way down to the foxhole. It connects the forward edge of the battle space to the most, um, one of the most advanced capabilities on the battle space, which is a UAS that can stay persistent and provide full motion video. And also they can breach up in a level of interoperability three, control the sensor on that UAS through that OSRVT. So it's an incredibly powerful capability to have all the way down at the foxhole level. And then also be able to employ small UASs to cover the gaps in between what you can't get in your full motion video and what you're actually experiencing at your tactical level. And then also the, the tactical UAS that's out there right now, the shadow system delivering full motion video um, to the brigade and below in the ISR, persistent ISR, providing that constant eye to the brigade commander in their battle space and what they need to shape and prosecute um, to win their fight. And then the Gray Eagle, our, our group four, which Paul told you is the most kinetic plat aviation platform right now deployed in any theater absolutely doing gangbusters and there's incredible dependency on what that platform brings from its multi-sensor and mostly its kinetic capability. And then delivering that capability also up above the echelons above division to our, to our strategic and national partners in the special operations community and the intelligence and security command and enabling them to continue to deliver their national and strategic ISR and prosecute the fight that they've been asked to fight. So that's what we concentrate on trying to bring what he articulates in a requirement or interprets in a, an existing requirement and bring that to a material solution, put it in the soldier's hand in terms of capability at echelon so they can employ that and be successful in the battle space. And so those mothers, daughters, sons, husbands can come home and, and live another day. So that's what we try to do, provide them capability and preserve the fight. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for hanging with us. Last event of the uh, Quad A tournament, as we like to say up here. Uh, certainly, last but not least, on the attack side, uh, I'm with my counterpart, Richard Tyler. Uh, I'm Jeff White from Fort Rucker. At least for the next uh, couple weeks, like uh, Paul and General Davis said, I'll be handing over to uh, Paul as we merge the uh, Tickums and combine 
efforts to maintain that unity of effort. So real quick on the attack reconnaissance side, we have uh, three primary lines of effort. Obviously the attack on the 64 D&E side, the reconnaissance as we divest on the 58 Legacy Fleet Alpha Delta, Ch Alpha Charlie Delta, and uh, as General Gaylor uh, described, modernize our training fleet and then bridge toward uh, a future reconnaissance platform by manned unmanned teaming capabilities with our UAS as Paul and Courtney have described. And on, uh, lastly, on the uh, weapons side of the house, uh, we have that in our portfolio on the munitions and the uh, related subsystems, Hellfire, JAGM, Joint Air Ground Missile, the uh, dual mode combined uh, next generation missile, air to ground missile, guided and unguided rockets, and 30 millimeter. So those three lines of effort, attack, recon, and munitions, are what we uh, focus on. And then the end state, as uh, General Gaylor described earlier, is increased reach protection and lethality to mitigate capability gaps and address those present and emerging threats that all of us are focused on uh, delivering for the, for the soldiers. Uh, and again, as we merge the uh, TICMs, uh, there'll be certainly some next month with uh, Paul, uh, there'll be certainly some economies of, of scale. Uh, and then the intent is to gain efficiencies as we work across multiple portfolios with the, with the multiple stakeholders on the stage, with the professionals uh, on the acquisition side and all the other stakeholders to deliver those capabilities and integrate them the best we can on, on the various different platforms. Just real quick on the ongoing initiatives and prioritization, uh, we're in the final stages of our H64D, or correction, H64E V6 capabilities production document that'll go forward to the AROC, to the Chief of Staff of the Army via paper uh, by the end, actually uh, very early in, in May. So we'll see that to fruition to codify requirements so the Army can prioritize the capability insertions based on affordability on our latest generation attack platform. Nextly, we also have the uh, Joint Air Ground Missile Capabilities Production Document uh, that's, uh, we just started actually, ARCIC and Army Staffing uh, to codify those requirements uh, ahead of the upcoming limited user test on JAGM, Milestone C decision, and the in initial op operational test and evaluation uh, all in 18 and 19. So a busy schedule on the JAGM side of the house. And then uh, lastly, the other uh, focus area in terms of prioritization is the Army Aviation Weapons Subsystems and Munition ICD. I had to look down at that. So we uh, tried to get all the related systems to deliver on the munition side. Uh, we're drafting that ICD, with, which is intended to increase lethality uh, increased stowed kills and standoff for both rotary wing and unmanned aircraft systems. And we're also leveraging a couple of operational need statements toward that long-term end state uh, by virtue of uh, lightweight precision munition and guided rockets in the form of advanced precision kill weapon system. Uh, again, to inform the broader, longer-term modular weapon system requirements. And of course, working with uh, Ryan and Zhang on the aircraft survivability side of the house to integrate those solutions on the uh, platform, specifically H64 D and E, uh, to improve survivability. So the reach protection and lethality lines of effort uh, or toward those end states are what we're all focused on. So that's just a snapshot of once over the world on the uh, attack reconnaissance side of the house, and I'll hand it off to uh, Richard on the PM side. Good afternoon. Uh, good to see you guys all again. Uh, like Courtney, I was up here about an hour and a half ago, so hopefully it's about the same pitch I gave you before. Uh, I'm the deputy project manager for the, uh, for the Apache attack helicopter. Uh, we, are organ we do our design, develop, and produce the aircraft. Uh, currently in production is the AH-64E. Uh, we Ha we are organized around three different product lines. Uh, first is the production and fielding, uh, which is actually doing the production act activities, uh, lot five, six, and multi-year producing on the aircraft. We also have the development and modernization product office handling all of the new activities that are going into the aircraft, 
they're primarily responsible for all of the activities, the V6 activities that was mentioned just a minute ago. And then finally, the other piece is the sensors product office. Um, that, that office handles anything. Basically, it's above, above the rotors or off the nose. It belongs, it belongs in the sensors product office. It's your MTADS, PINVAS, fire control radar, MUMT capabilities, et cetera. So uh, with that, I'll stop there and we'll turn it over to you guys for questions, I think. Okay, no, thanks, gentlemen. I appreciate it very much. So note to self next year then in terms of the agenda lineup and all that, right? For, for Quad A, and I didn't realize that all the TICMs, or excuse me, the PMs were supporting their boss when he was getting all the hard questions, so I should have known that. But anyway, uh, I, I dominated yesterday with the first question, and, I, and I'll, I'll just relate it to you, which was I asked the question, what was the most effective way for industry to come back into you all, both at the TICM and the PM level, to really have a discussion about kind of the capabilities they bring? So. I'm not asking that right now. If you can weave some of that in on any of the questions that we may get, but uh, we have about 30 minutes left, and so that's great. You've, you've got the brain trust here. They, they live in a pretty tough world, particularly the, the folks on the system side and the aircraft survivability side trying to make things happen for the particular platform and the capabilities that it delivers. But with that, I'll open it up, Jen. I know you may have the first question, but if someone gets to the mic before her, no. Please. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask about the threat warning system. Um, I, I know that, that there's potential to replace CMOS eventually. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can sort of tease out your plans um, on how you want to go about um, finding a replacement for that and what, what exactly you're looking for in a next generation system. All right, I will, uh, I'll start to answer it first, and then I'll definitely turn it over to Colonel Lee. So, you know, on, on the detection side, you know, really there becomes multiple threats and multiple systems. Um, so I think right now even we, we've got our current system, um, which is CMOS, and everybody understands that, I think, or at least most of, most of you in here. So it has certain capabilities, right? Um, there are, there are newer capabil capabilities out there that industry has produced. Um, and to a very limited extent, some of those have even been bought for a particular area. So now as we continue to move forward, understanding um, you know, as weapon systems proliferate, um, as we acknowledge you know, possible fights against peer threats, um, we acknowledge even our, our in-state goal, which I'll hit here in a sec, but there is still a capability and a capacity gap, and especially at the capability level, there is, there is capability that industry can provide right now. So we're interested in that, and that's the, the DR that Colonel Lee touched on, that that is currently you know, very fresh, just released. Um, so that gives us that capability, and then really also, I think, buys us the time to do a very deliberate uh, on, on my part, really getting the requirement right. What is the requirement for this future detection system? Um, what, all, what all can it do at, at what point in time? Um, that really gives us the ability um, where in the, in the current environment right now, we really have to have acquired threat weapon systems. Um, really understand how they work and then develop the ability to, de to, to detect them or defeat them. Where in the future, we're looking for a way not to have to do that. Um, where we stay ahead of the enemy on the ability to detect any system that's out there on the battlefield. That's what that future requirement will look like. That's much easier said than done. So that's why we're taking the time to really figure out how that requirement needs to look. And then so we can provide that somewhere in the future. And really where Colonel Lee and all his extremely smart people kind of figure that out and help us with it. But um, that, you know, that, that's the way it's laid out. So I, I think um, Colonel Coy put it really um, eloquently or, or succinctly as far as what we need in the future. And, and the way that we're looking at this is that um, we're trying to make sure that we have a system of systems approach into um, protecting our soldiers. Um, so what we're trying to do is we have a current system 
we're trying to make sure that our current systems are effective against current threats. So that's number one, make sure that whatever we have right now are effective against the current threats. Second thing is, as, as Colonel Kuo mentioned, we want to make sure that we have a bridging strategy until we get to the long-term strategy. Um, and so, and then the velocity of the, the future strategy is based on availability of technology, as well as, uh, and, and some, some extent, funding, because the funding has a big vote. Um, so what we're looking at is making sure that we're able to, number one, protect the current force, number two, have a bridging strategy to the future, and number three, going after the long-term strategy, which is replacing the current common missile warning system. So those are the three-phase approach. Uh, and I think um, the team has done a great job of uh, working with uh, Fort Rucker uh, and the stakeholders, uh, various different stakeholders, to make sure that we're able to do those three simultaneous phases potentially at the same time. Uh, Philip Kwong with Intelsat General Corporation. Uh, my question is about drones. So when we look at the future, okay, uh, the aviation follows pattern. It's recon, then air to ground, and then air to air. Okay, so we've been fortunate operating in a benign, generally non-contested environment for a long time. That's probably going to change. So what is going to be the trigger for the Army to say, okay, we need to think about the recon, counter-recon fight, the drone, counter-drone fight, because the Navy's already thinking about swarm and counter-swarm. But industry can't respond until the Army says we need to start thinking about that. So in your mind, the threat indicator's are already there. What does the trigger say? We need to start thinking about this and say it to industry. So one, um, they're not drones. They're unmanned air vehicles. Check. <laughs> drones implies that they're just Roger. doing something mindlessly, blindly, not producing an outcome. So we don't Roger. unmanned aircraft. UAS, Roger. All right. So two, I, I, I disagree that the, the Army doesn't need to tell you what you should be pursuing. If you're sitting and waiting for the Army to tell you how to do swarming, you're going to be waiting for a long time. So if the Army, if the Navy's already articulated that, I get forwarded articles all the time with people talking about swarming and swarming, uh, swarming unmanned aircraft systems. So you, you, you don't need somebody to articulate that into a, into a requirements document. If you know it's already being done and you have a capability, I'll tell you the way to, that industry, and if you've ever heard me speak before, if you're looking for a way, and, and I think this was the answer that you, you got earlier from General Todd is, you need to become familiar with RD Ecom and the Army Lab system. Because that's where all the 61, 62, 63 dollars that are developing it, and the kind of the petri dish for those technologies um, come out of. So they don't enter at the program level because a program's already defined by a requirement it's got a program baseline and it's already executing to that. So we don't introduce new stuff necessarily right at inception. So if you get into the lab program and you're familiar with that, and I'll tell you that because the unmanned aircraft community, I don't think the manned platform community is pretty aware of it. The unmanned aircraft community, I don't think really is. You need to get familiar with the lab program um, because that's where all that technology gets like the Petri dish and that's where it grows and then that's where it migrates. And that's everything. That's the sensors that go on the unmanned aircraft systems, the propulsion system, the, the fly-by-wire systems, everything. So in, in, regard to, uh, in regard to the threat scenario that we're going to face uh, in the future, I, I don't think it's a, a secret to anybody in here um, what threat scenario we're going to face and, and the fact that we're going to have to have a survivable platform in the future. Now, we've put that in our requirements documents because it's like Ryan alluded to earlier. We don't want to be in a, in, a, in a react, counteract, react, counteract mode. We want to make the enemy react to what we do. Um, you know, as far as what we're going to need in terms of survivability in that environment, when our ICD comes out, it's very broad. It's not going to give you down to a CPD level. It needs to be this size. It needs to fly this airspeed. It needs to go this high. It's going to give you the broad gaps that we have and have the hooks in it to be able to develop CDDs that pull the technology in that we need to execute. And you know, when, when people go, what do you see that as being? You know, we're gonna have shadows and graves around for a long time. Late 20s, early 30s, the shadow's gonna be there and we'll continue to improve it as a bridge. But we don't want to tie 
what we're bringing in to something that already exists because then that chains us to that and that, that limits the innovation that'll happen. I mean, you see the innovations that's going on with, with civilian unmanned aircraft right now and imagine where it's going to be in 10 years. We don't even know what it's going to look like. So we're not going to limit that innovation. What I'll tell you is if I'm a BCT commander and, I, and I'm on the plains of Europe and, and I know I've got a Russian threat bearing down on me, I want a UAS that I don't have to have an 18-wheeler to haul across the terrain to get where I need to be. I don't want to be on any of the hundreds of landing strips that have already been targeted with more artillery than all of NATO combined could put together. And I want it to be survivable when I put it overhead of a soldier. And I want that guy on the edge of the battle that is looking down his sights to be able to control that and target the enemy with that. If you can build me something like that, I'll give you all the money. He'll give you all the money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, well, I'm going to pile on too, so that's a good note to self. I mean, uh, maybe you guys can get a buy next quad A time frame. I need to get the research development engineering command and MR deck and, you know, what's going on at the, at the S&T and the lab level in here to have a discussion with industry about what they're doing. So I appreciate the, the prompt on that. I think that's good. Good job. That was, that, was, that was good. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Art Bossart from Harris Corporation. Uh, just a, a question about the, uh, the next generation threat. I uh, understand that there may be some effort by the Army to staff a requirement for RF countermeasures uh, to address some of these new threats. And it, I guess if that's the case, will that uh, be a new procurement or a mod to an existing system or, or what? Uh, just some comments on that would be appreciated. So I think that's a very good question as far as the, uh, the emerging requirements. Um, I think what we're looking at is obviously, um, as we look at these different technologies, we want to make sure we have the agility to understand the detected threat and what do we do once we have the threats in our picture. So those are the things that we're looking at. As far as is it going to be a new program record? Is it going to be a new director requirement? It's still pretty decisional. We're waiting on the outcome of uh, the direction from the, uh, um, from the leadership. But I think what we're doing uh, between the stakeholders, uh, the user community, and, and, and the program material developers is that we're looking at what can we do as far as the TTP, what can we do as far as the current systems that we have on board, as well as the new systems that we're developing. Uh, for example, I mentioned about the DV2, uh, the APR39 DV2, uh, which is a digital receiver, which gives us a lot more um, capabilities to detect what's out there. And then the next question is, now once we detect those threats, then what? Because a lot of times you can put a lot of things on the aircraft and the challenge with uh, obviously um, a manned platform is that you have a swap C consideration, size, weight, power, and coolant. So, so that's what, those are the trade space we're looking at right now. But as far as additional requirements, we're still looking at the emerging requirements right now. Thank you, sir. So one thing I'll mention too about that. So we acknowledge, are, are we optimized right now for that environment? No, and I, I think we, we've acknowledged that you know, openly um, and, we're, and we're pursuing exactly what Colonel Lee just talked about. But, but for example, one thing we're doing this summer, we were able to acquire joint dollars, but also with some help from the PMs uh, to actually go out and take TTPs for an RF environment that have been developed by the Army and with the joint community and actually go out and test those TTPs at China Lake um, and, and take it through some real rigor um, that, it, that applies the math to it, not just somebody at home station having an emitter and kind of seeing what happens, whether they can break lock or not. And that will be with our current systems, not, not to test anything that, that uh, you know, the, the, the acquisition world is working on for the future, but how would we fight tonight or how would we fight tomorrow that is what that test will inform. The, the TTP associated with the current you know, defeat that we have right now, which is really the expendables, to, to really break lock, right? To optimize that, and then how fast we're able to you know, get a program of record to, to provide even additional capability to add to what we currently have right now. So we, we are very much moving out doing that. There's just. A lot of it, just like Colonel Lee said, the, the funding associated with it drives where some of that uh, will occur and when it will occur. But, but it is definitely gaining momentum.
First of all, thanks for hanging in with the rest of us today. <laughs> My name is Glenn Monrad. I'm with Booz Allen Hamilton at uh, Aberdeen Proving Ground area. I have a kind of a broad question. With the shift that General Tate talked today about moving back into parts of Europe that we haven't been for, for before, my thought is that it probably portends some impact to both the ISR mission and the, the both uh, manned and unmanned ISR and the comm systems kind of requirements. Um, are there any things that you're planning to accelerate in development or release from development into production and capabilities uh, that go along with that new mission set? I'll jump on that grenade. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, Colonel Levine, our, our Tickham lift with fixed wing, uh, and ISR associated with that fixed wing, or probably even Tickham aerial sensors are the kind of people that should be answering that question. So take whatever I say with something that I made up here because he handed me the microphone. Um, so I, I don't know that ISR is really a, you know, a new mission set. I mean, we've, it's been out there for a long time. And regarding technologies, uh, from an unmanned side of the house, we're always looking to increase the capability and increase the range of our sensors on the battlefield. Uh, we right now uh, are working, as I said earlier, to change the, the KPP for a shadow unmanned system. So a BCT with a shadow unmanned system, uh, changing the KPP on a sensor to integrate some of the newest technology that is available today that wasn't available when the shadow was bought a long time ago to exceed enemy threat weapons ranges and acoustic signatures for that platform is something that we want to put into the hands of the soldiers in the next 24 months. So we're attempting to do an AROC to change that KPP to accelerate that for that unmanned aircraft system. In terms of uh, what goes on the Gray Eagle and the pieces parts going on the Gray Eagle, there is, there's a lot of movement, especially in the INSCOM community, for sensors for the Gray Eagle, um, one of which is the, the TSP or the tactical signal payload and the other two that exist to go on uh, a platform, which they're preferring the Gray Eagle, is the MFU, the Multifunction Electronic Warfare, uh, both small and large that's going on. And I don't have a lot of depth on that, but I know that both those programs are moving forward through their individual TICMs and through their individual PMs for approval to go forward. So those, those are three technologies that are in the pipeline. I don't know that they're being, uh, we're, we're accelerating a sensor for the shadow, but I don't know that the other two are being accelerated. I think they're following their due course, uh, but it is coming to fruition that that'll be sooner than later. Hey, Paul, the other thing too on the man side of the house, and I think this gets after maybe a little bit broader, not just ISR, but reconnaissance, arm reconnaissance side of the house. So in terms of accelerating on our side, we're working with the respective platform PMs to increase the capability of our manned, unmanned teaming Again, that's not just on the rotor wing side, that's also on the UAS side, up to including LOI-4, which is a supervised control of the platform itself from the manned rotor wing. So that, that's a, a, a piece of this in terms of the armed reconnaissance mission as we bridge the gap for, for essentially a armed reconnaissance platform divesting 58 deltas till we get to something else in the future. So hopefully that answers uh, part of it. And going back to, uh, we getting shut down, sir? Keep that. Oh. Sorry, hey, Will. Can you hear us back there, over over the uh, the noise? Thanks. I was going to mention too that, going back to General Davis's point in terms of what what can industry do to help us inform requirements and inform material solutions. So perhaps it's leveraging some of the systems and subcomponents, not just on the sensors, but on the aircraft survivability side of the house. So if we can merge some of the capabilities of our sensors to do both ASC and target acquisition or radar detection or whatever the case may be, that's, that's where, again, we can gain efficiencies, if you will, and synchronize efforts. And that's, again, working with our industry partners to help get toward that end state. And that addresses what Zhang said, you know, swap C is a, is a, you know, important aspect of all of this as we start looking for real estate on our aircraft, on our platform to hang these pieces and parts on. So. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Megan Doherty Myers from Avocent. Um, my questions pertain to DVE mitigation. Colonel Hanna, you mentioned previously that DVE program was up and coming, um, but I'm wondering if you could add a layer, layer of detail to that. And then also, prior panels have indicated that special operation aviation is going to play kind of a leading larger role in regards to DVE program. How, how is that distributed among you? Where, where does DVE live, so to speak? Okay, so I'll uh, kind of uh, lay it out just quickly. The DVE, the Radio Visual Environment Mitigation, Mitigation Program, falls under AMARDEC and is in the research and development. And I thought I saw S Colonel Steve Bradham around here earlier, but uh, say he bailed. Okay, well, uh, it, it, that, that's the name to look for, and he can. I, I kind of reserve. I don't talk about uh, other people's programs, so uh, I'll, I'll defer to him for his program in particular, and then. Uh, my program is primarily the DVE Brownout Rotorcraft Enhancement System, or DVE Bores, and uh, I'll defer to my uh, Tickham counterpart for the status of the requirement. So that requirement right now, it's actually in worldwide staffing as it, as it moves through the Army process. Um, as kind of I mentioned earlier, this, this initial requirement, um, it is leveraging kind of the technology maturation that's occurred to this point. Um, other programs that the Army is pursuing, learning from those programs, you know, where, where we can um, to create this initial capability, um, which will be, um, you know, single, single ship, take off and land um, in a dust uh, sand environment. Um, and then, like I talked about earlier, that ability, and remember too, right now, we're, we're talking about the sensor, which I'll kind of just circle back on DVE in general. But then it, as we move out, you know, it's really that capability to be able to land, take off, fly and route in multiple environments. And you get into things where you'll talk about range and penetration of obscurance and all those things, but to really be able to, to fight in that environment. And then even like if we really go way out there, it's too bad Colonel Bentley isn't here, you know, kind of even what Colonel White talked about, all these sensors that we have on these aircraft, you know, somewhere in the future, they will be all optimized where the same sensor may tell me that there is a 2S6 somewhere 10 kilometers to my front. It is telling me that I have wires one kilometer to my front and it's informing all of those things that really lead to the DVE solution, which it's not just those sensors and, and that, that optimal mix of sensors, but the flight controls and how the flight controls are informed by the sensors, but then also the symbology and cueing you'll use too. And then somewhere in there is how the, the helmet is played in, whether there's a, there's a heads up display, whether it's in some type of uh, tracking monocle. I mean, all those things will create that eventual, the eventual environment um, that, that, that you know, is, we are pursuing at the, at the end state. So you know, that's DVE overall, but what, but what I started out with and what Matt, you know, that initial requirement, that's what we're pursuing. And I think it's in line with what we've been pursuing uh, for a while and, and starting out with just at the, at the situational awareness level. Yeah, so I can book into just a little bit and add on uh, that we've had a program of record in SOCOM since uh, 2013. Uh, we started out with, it's basically a three-year effort and three, three phases, and we're currently in phase three of that developmental effort. We're really looking hard, and we've learned a lot in those three phases. We learned a lot before that with some DARPA efforts that we participated in. So in, in, in addition, in parallel to the Army's program, in parallel to AMARDEX efforts, I think the entire community has learned a lot about what is really in the art of the possible when it comes to sensors, seeing through dust, seeing through obscurance, and then fusing those images in real time, right? So there's, there's some challenges there that we've learned a lot about. We're putting some pieces together. We've absolutely been leading a little bit of that development in SOCOM, and I, and I see us continuing to stay lashed up with the Army as we move forward. So ladies and gentlemen, I can hear the 100-mile-an-hour uh, tape coming out for the packing boxes and everything right now. So in the spirit of you know, training to standard, not time, appreciate it very much, and thank you all for uh, hanging in. And I'd like you to thank them for the service and, and what they're doing for the Army and so our soldiers. Today.